Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual author presentation with Alan D. D. Gaff, author of Lou Gehrig, The Lost Memoir. This program is part of our friends at the Frankfurt Library annual meeting, The Thrill of Victory, History of America Revealed Through Baseball. These projects have been made possible through a grant from Indiana Humanities in cooperation with the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional sponsors include the Industrial Federal Credit Union, American Legion Post Number 12, BFW Post Number 1110, Encompass Credit Union, Fraternal Order of Eagles Number 976, and Gangware Powers Insurance. If you're interested in learning more about the history of baseball or the Friends of the Frankfurt Library, we will be having an exhibit in our gallery on display from today to the end of the month on baseball. It is really interesting. Mindy did a great job putting it together. And then on Friday, May 12th, starting at 4 p.m., we will have a Connor Ferry presentation about historic baseball games at 4.30. The Indian State Museum will make a presentation on vintage baseball collection, including a uniform worn by Carl Erskine. At 5.30, a representative of, a representative of the Indianapolis Indians will be present to share baseball stories through the year. And at 6.15 p.m. is the Friends Annual Meeting. This is open to the public. And finally, at 6.30, author Mark Monty will make a presentation and book signing. So please give your attention to author Alan D. Gaff. Thank you, Allison. And I'd like to thank Mindy Emsweiler for the invitation to come and sort of kick off your, your very special baseball program. I wish I could have been there in person uh, we only live in Fort Wayne, but I've got difficulty traveling, so I'm ending up doing more Zoom calls than I do anything in person now, so uh, I hope that's not a problem for anyone. Maureen and I, my well, Maureen, my wife, and I have uh, been rabid supporters of public libraries, and we've spent three decades as volunteers at the Allen County Library here in Fort Wayne. As a, just a coincidence, Maureen and I are also on today celebrating the 54th anniversary of our first date. So thank you for joining in. And, you know, if you want to give a hurrah, that's okay with me. Now, the, the book that we're discussing, Lou Gehrig, The Lost Memoir, had its origins in another book that I had written on World War I about the Lost Battalion. One of the officers that I was trying to find information on had moved to California, and I was trying to find more information about him because he had a central part in the book. But in the process of doing that, I found Lou Gehrig's columns that he wrote for the Oakland Tribune in 1927, which was the year the New York Yankees became known as Murderer's Row sweeping basically through the American League and the World Series, arguably one of the best baseball teams in American history. As soon as I found the, these columns, I went to work and could find no trace of them anywhere on the internet, anywhere in any books. So I got in touch with my agent named Roger Williams, told him what I had found, Unknowns to me, he immediately called Stuart Rogers at Simon & Schuster, and within two days, the three of us were discussing uh, a new book. So I give credit both to Roger and for Stuart to uh, understand the importance of what I had found and agree that it needed to be put before the public. So... I'll give you sort of a short recap of, of Lou Gehrig's career and then a few extra things at the end, maybe. Um, 
Lou Gehrig was a first generation American. His parents were German. He was born June 19th in 1903. He had two sisters and a brother, all of which died in infancy or toddler, toddler age. So he was an only child and he was essentially a mother's boy his whole life. His mother doted on him and as he grew up, he took care of his mother to the best of his ability. Well, Lou Gehrig spoke German until the age of five when he went to school for the first time. Both his parents were immigrants and Lou would one day look back and say, I was a poor kid. We lived in a poor neighborhood, but it was in America where even poor kids in poor neighborhoods got good breaks with playgrounds, supervised athletics, and good schools. Well, Lou was a little fat kid and the neighborhood boys never asked him to play their sports because he was uncoordinated, unable to run. Kids realized he was a swimmer eventually and invited him to come swimming with them either in the Hudson or the Harlem River. He was sort of an incorrigible youth, according to his own admission. One time while he, he was swimming, his father had to come to the police station to essentially bail him out because he'd been caught by a cop swimming naked. But swimming opened the door to baseball in the streets because kids now accepted him as a possible friend. And uh, even though he wasn't good at baseball, they invited him to come and participate. Sometimes they just let him be an out, uh, outlaw. Well, he would be a scout uh, to watch for the cops who came and would drive the kids away from playing baseball in the streets because it was a danger. Lou became bigger and stronger when he accompanied his father to the German Turnverein, where his father would play cards and drink beer, but Lou would use the athletic equipment to build up his body and lose weight. By the time he was in high school, his high school, the School of Commerce, had won the unofficial New York City best baseball title. The New York Daily News posted pregame photos of him at practice while they were at Ebbets Field in preparation for a, what was billed as a national high school game against a team from Chicago. When the New York team arrived in Chicago, they had an opportunity to tour the city and see all the sights but the boys voted to watch a Cubs game instead. When the two high school teams met, the New York team was ahead eight to six in the top of the ninth inning. Lou Gehrig came up and smashed a grand slam home run to secure their victory. He immediately became a hero in New York City. Newspaper columnists compared him to Babe Ruth, but amid all the accolades, the newspapers also misspelled his name and put another player's name under, as a caption under his photo. He was accepted at Columbia University in 1921 and belonged to Phi Delta Theta, which basically was composed of a large number of upper-class kids, whereas Lou Gehrig came from a poor family. He was in college, but was never really a part of any of the college activities because he just didn't fit in. His clothes were bad, his speech still had a German accent, and the only reason he was accepted into the, uh, the fraternity was because he was an athlete and that gave their 
fraternity more status on the university campus. He was suspended for his first year because he made the mistake of playing with a minor league team under an assumed name. But when he became reinstated for sports at Columbia, he was better at football than he was at baseball. There was nothing Lou liked better than to crash through a line carrying the football and score. He tried out as a pitcher for Columbia, but was not very good. He was wild when he pitched, an example being in one game, he struck out 17 batters, but lost five to one because he gave up too many walks. On one occasion, Lou hit one of the longest home runs ever seen at Columbia's stadium. And there just happened to be a Yankee scout in the crowd and immediately came down, got in touch with Lou's coach. And the next day, since the Gehrig family was in bad, bad, badly in need of um, money, the the mother of the family being in in the hospital with pneumonia, the father being in a sort of an itinerant iron worker, uh, Lou immediately took advantage and signed a contract for fifteen hundred dollars with the Yankees. After he finished his junior year at Columbia, Lou joined the Yankees but it wasn't exactly what he had thought it would be. He sat on the bench essentially the rest of the season until he was sent back to the minors and to play for the Hartford Senators. At one point while he was with the Senators, he thought that alcohol might sharpen players who essentially were well, there's no other way to say it. They were pretty much alcoholics. But booze really didn't help his playing. He said it basically tasted like the inside of a second baseman's glove. But his coach, Pat O'Connor, realized what was going on, chewed him out, told him that his future was almost guaranteed if he would stop doing stupid stuff like drinking. So... Lou decided to quit. From then on, he basically would drink beer occasionally, but left hard alcohol alone until the last few years of his life. When he looked back on that interesting phase of his career, he called it his two-week drunk. After spending 1923-1924 at Hartford, he was called back up to the Yankees for each one of the World Series runs in those years, but never really produced any kind of a record. He joined the Yankees as a regular in 1925 and was befriended by Babe Ruth, who at first looked upon Lou as his gopher and would send him to pick, pick up drinks and sandwiches and even arranged dates with women. As a way of showing his uh, appreciation, at one point, Ruth sat in the dugout and gave him financial information, telling Lou, you need to save your money. Don't squander it. Be smart about it. You know, invest it. Plan for the future. And the whole time he was telling this to Lou, everyone else in the dugout were just laughing their butts off because at that point, Babe Ruth had squandered probably a quarter of a million dollars of his baseball income. So obviously he was not a good investment advisor. The Yankees that he joined had a wild life that was probably beyond other teams. One 
one writer called it grand and mad and wild and goofy. There were the three Yankee Bs, baseball, booze, and broads, but never necessarily in that order. On June 2nd of 1925, the regular first baseman, Wally Pipp, got lime in his eyes in a whirl of dust, and Lou went in to replace him and would remain in that position for the rest of his career. He turned out to be a great hitter, maybe just above average fielder, and a terrible base runner. He also, by this time, had acquired a couple nicknames, mostly based upon his large German appetite for food. In college, he'd been called biscuit pants for his atti attitude at the dinner table, but the Yankees saw better and started calling him custard pie because that was his favorite dessert. When I say Lou Gehrig was a great hitter, he could really smack the ball as hard as anybody ever has done in the major leagues. At one point during a practice, he, he was at bat, took several fastballs directly down the plate from the, the pitcher, threw down his bat, stormed out to the pitcher's mound, and really cussed out the pitcher telling him that he was always afraid throughout his entire career of smashing the ball back to the pitcher and killing him. By 1927, the Yankees were arguably the best baseball team ever. On the 4th of July, they played a doubleheader and won the first game 12-1 to and the second game 22-1. to the first baseman on their opposing team basically said, those fellows not only beat you, they tear your heart out. During this time, Lou's personal life was in the order of his mother, baseball, and fishing. He loved to go fishing along with his mother and his father. And for some reason or other, they rather catch eels than fish. His mother had a recipe for eels that Babe Ruth loved. So she would continue to make fried eels for the team for years, although some of the players refused to eat them. Although Babe Ruth liked to eat his in conjunction with a big bowl of chocolate ice cream. Um, in doing my research, I guarantee you that I did not indulge in any of the eel research. There was no room for girlfriends in Lou Gehrig's life and his teammates made fun of him. They said that he could score on the field, but never with women and players refused to fix him up with a date, claiming he wouldn't know what to do with a girl if he had one. He was obviously different from people on the team like Babe Ruth and Bob Musel, who on road trips would get to their hotel, strip naked, order beer and fill the back bathtubs with ice to keep the beer cold. As far as Lou was concerned, if he was on a road trip, he would take walks, watch movies, and ride on a roller coaster. There were a number of individuals on the Yankees that had some interesting quirks about them. Third baseman Joe Dugan would gamble away every World Series check. He liked to drink, he liked to fool around with women, and at one point on a Chicago road trip, he and a couple of his friends 
met some gangster and said, you know, it'd be really nice if we could meet Al Capone. Could you arrange that? And they they did get a chance to meet Al Capone, complete with Tommy Gun guards at the doors and Al Capone sitting behind a desk under pictures of himself and a couple presidents. Actually, they didn't think it was quite as fun as they thought, so they got out of there as quick as possible. I think they were overawed by the uh, the Tommy guns more than anything else. One of Dugan's pals when it came to drinking was pitcher Wait Hoyt. The odd thing about him was, in addition to being a Yankee, he also had a job as an undertaker at his father-in-law's business. One day while he was waiting for the game to start at Yankee Stadium, he got a call from his father-in-law saying uh, there was a corpse in the neighborhood and wanted to know if uh, Waite could go pick it up. He said, sure. So Waite got in his car, drove to the location, picked up the corpse, put it in his trunk, drove back, parked at Yankee Stadium, went in when the game started and won the game, drove away, went back to the uh, funeral parlor and delivered the corpse in time for dinner. Everyone loved that story. Third baseman, oh, excuse me, second baseman, Mark Koenig, used to take a drill with him when they went on road trips. And he would drill through hotel walls so he and other players could peek through the wall and see what was going on in the next room. They also liked to stand on each other's shoulders and peek through the transoms above the window. Whoever was on the shoulders giving a play-by-play -play to the guys downstairs in the hall. Pitcher Herb Pennick was a genius when it comes to memory, and he could help every batter in a slump or needing some sort of assistance to increase his batting average or his power. But even though he could assist other hitters, someone said he couldn't, feel, he couldn't hit the water if he fell out of a canoe. He also couldn't sleep on road trips and could never start a game in a opposite, an opposing city. Pitcher Urban Shocker was grandfathered in when spitballs were banned, but could still throw a spitball that would throw spray off when it came across the plate. Relief pitcher Will Seymour was an abysmal hitter. Babe Ruth said he was so bad that he would bet $15 and give Will Se 20 to 1 odds that he would not get three hits during the 1927 season. When he finally got his third hit in August, Babe Ruth paid up and Wilsey used the money to buy two mules for his farm, naturally named them Babe and Ruth. Catcher Pat Collins, whose name for some reason was Horse Nose, sent most of his throws to second base to catch runners into center field. The alternate catcher, John Grabowski, was able to spit tobacco juice through his mask without touching any of the metal guard. Everyone thought that was quite a, uh, <laughs> quite a profession to have. Left fielder Bob Musil was Babe's drinking buddies, as I mentioned before. On train trips, they would ride in a car. Sometimes it was a passenger car. Sometimes it was a freight car. Drink beer, which was, by the way, during the, the prohibition, and eat ribs. Babe loved barbecue ribs, so that was usually their their feed on the way home to New York. But once they were finished, they would take aim at telephone poles along the tracks 
to see who could hit the most with the empty bottles and the uh, rib bones. The center fielder was Earl Combs, who had never shut his mouth. They called him a barber because at that time, barbers just talked incessantly to their clients in the chair. But Earl Combs was an outlier, essentially, on the Yankee team. He never used tobacco, never played cards, wouldn't even drink a Coca-Cola, and read the Bible every night in his room. Naturally, he was a pal of blues, and they would often go to movies together. The big Peter Pan of the Yankees was Babe Ruth, who knew no boundaries whatsoever. He chewed tobacco at the age of five, and by 10 was drinking whiskey. His motto was easy living, easy money, easy women, and easy booze. Earl Combs, the Bible reader, thought of him simply as dumb as an ox. Now, interestingly enough, Babe had quite an inclination for fun. He liked to golf, but was terrible at it. One day while he was out shooting, <laughs> shooting his clubs and the ball, um, he was doing terribly on the green, so he blamed the squirrels in the trees for the problem. He ordered the caddy to go get him a 22 rifle, and he shot squirrels during the rest of the round, getting enough that he could have squirrel pot pie for supper that evening. He also liked to throw a lighted cigarette into <laughs> Hushima Tony Lazari's pants as he was pulling them up to get ready for a game. He would also nail shoes to the floor for people. He would cut off legs and arms of uniforms. But the other players got back at him one day in a trip where some of the players had gone to a bordello and stole the madam's parrot. On the way back, they hid the parrot in Babe Ruth's straw hat. By the time he went to get dressed, put his straw hat on, he found it full of parrot poo. So uh, there was a lot of give and take when it came to uh, the fun, as it was called. But this was the team that breezed through the 1927 season with a record of 110 wins, 44 losses, and one tie. And they earned the title Murderer's Row, which has been uh, associated with the 1927 Yankees ever since. Now, if you'll pardon me while I grab the book, Once the book was in almost in print, everything was almost decided. I had come across something else that everyone wanted to put in, which was titled Lou Gehrig's Tips on How to Watch a Ball Game. If you ever own the book, it's in the very back behind the roster of players that are mentioned in the, uh, in the book. But most people don't know it's there because they don't go to quite the end. So I thought I would read his tips to you so that if you don't look at the end of the book, you'll at least have heard what he had to say. His first tip, to properly enjoy the game, you should have a thorough knowledge of the playing rules, which can be bought in almost any book or sporting goods store. Number two, Always follow the ball. Instead of following it, many of the fans watch the runners who try to steal a base or come home on a hit. By following the base runner instead of the ball, 
many of the fans miss the plays. Having trouble with the page. Okay, rule number three. You can enjoy the game more if you try to put yourself in the position of one of the players on the field or one of the managers under of either team. Number four, when there is an exciting moment on the diamond, for example, two men out and two men on base, try to visualize all the possible situations while waiting for the pitcher to deliver the ball. Number five, when a new batter comes to the plate, it's interesting to notice how the outfield and infield shift to play him. Now you can tell what kind of batter he is. Number six, it's interesting to notice the different attitude of players during a ball game. Some are excited, some very cool, and others seem to be half asleep. But most of the time, those who seem to be sleepy certainly find you when the play starts. Number seven, keep up on your baseball news in the newspapers and on the radio. You'll get more kick out of the game if you know the past performances of the various players. And number eight, when the umpire makes a decision, you may think him wrong, but remember, he is well grounded in the rules of play. Keep in mind that in an argument between players and the umpire, the umpire is usually right. The player is prejudiced by his desire to win. And lastly, number nine, don't be misled, don't, excuse me, don't be misled by the shouts and opinions of other spectators. Sometimes from the shouts around you, it seems as if everything on the field is a mistake. It usually isn't. The cry you most often hear is balk. You hear it perhaps a hundred times. And during that time, the pitcher makes perhaps one balk. In 1921, Major League Baseball designated every June 2nd to be Lou Gehrig Day to honor his achievements and raise awareness for ALS, the incurable disease that killed him. If you read my book or any other book about Lou, I hope you will donate this year along with millions of other Americans to this worthy cause. That's all I've got for you today, but if you have questions, I will sit and answer questions as long as they come. Thank you so much. If anyone has questions, they can either enter it into the chat. You can open the chat by hovering, by clicking the option on the bottom of your screen, or you can unmute yourself and ask. Alan, my name is Megan Sheath, and my question is, I mean, from looking at your book, there's just such depth of research that you've done for this book. Are you also a sports fan or a, a, a big baseball fan? Because I know you have a lot of, um, you've written his, on historical matters, so um, why go to some sports? Well, <laughs> I've, I've just published in February my 15th book. All of them have been on military history, except for the Lou Gehrig book. As I mentioned, you know, I came across the material um, just by accident. I had been a Yankee fan when I was a kid during the Mickey Mantle era. So I, I was sort of familiar with the Yankee background and a, a number of the names. But right now I'm a football fan. Uh, I'm a Indianapolis Colts more than anything. I played baseball when I was a kid. I had four years of Little League and two years of Pony League. Uh, actually, when I was in Little League, I did something that Lou Gehrig never could do in his entire career. Where we played baseball, there was a diamond, then there was a road, and then there was a creek. 
during one at bat, I fall, I fouled all of the game balls into the creek. <laughs> the, the game was put on hold for about 15 minutes while people were trying to fish balls out of the creek, looking through trunks of cars and in gym bags, trying to find a couple balls that would still serve as a, a good enough for a game. So um, Lou Gehrig never did that. So I, I guess I'm up on him just in that category. That's fun facts. Thank you. Yeah, there's all kinds of things. I one okay. I'll I'll give you another example. When I was in Pony League, I the first time I was up, I hit the ball back at the pitcher. Now this is this refers to what Lou Gehrig had talked about being afraid he was going to kill a pitcher. I hit the first ball back to the pitcher hit him in the arm. He had to be taken out of the game. I got to first base on a single. Second time I came up, I hit the ball back to the pitcher, hit him in the shoulder, had to be taken out of the game. I got an infield single. The third time I came up, I hit it back to the pitcher, hit him in the thigh. He had to be taken out of the game and I got an infield single. The fourth time I came up, the last pitcher was on the, on the mound for the opposing team, and he just looked over at the bench and says, Coach, what do I do? <laughs> and the coach says, Well, you gotta walk him. You're the last pitcher we've got. So I went three for <laughs> I went three for three and knocked three pitchers out of the game. Did you earn a nickname for that? No, I didn't, but I'm surprised I didn't. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, Alan. This is Mindy. Hi, Mindy. I was just wondering, uh, do you plan to write any more books um, about sports history? Maybe football? Yes, I do. <laughs> I have <laughs> one in the works right now okay. uh, on baseball, which also includes Lou Gehrig. It's a, a correspondence between Lou Gehrig and Rogers Hornsby, another Hall of Fame player. Um, so uh, it's a manuscript right now. All the all the correspondence has been transcribed. All I need is a, an introduction and that's probably half completed. So within another year, there just may be another Lou Gehrig out there with my name on it. Oh, that's great. Glad to hear it. Thank you. Are people in Frankfurt shy? Well, you asked if people in Frankfurt were shy, but I think in Frankfurt with the, we have great baseball programs throughout our community, all the way from Pee Wee up through Babe Ruth and of course the, the high school level. So it's the, the best entertainment in town is, our, is the baseball in the summertime. That's awesome. Well, in, in Fort Wayne, we have something that's sort of unique it's called Wildcat Baseball, and it, it's basically available to any kid that wants to sign up, boy or girl, no matter what the age, they've got age ranges. So anyone that wants to play baseball as a child has the opportunity to do it. Um, some of the games are, I would say, very interesting, just to maybe shield kids from <laughs> critical comments, but uh, it's it's a great opportunity you know we still have the little league pony league and and, and that but uh, to give everyone an opportunity to play baseball is is something that the uh, the donors have really done a favor to our city with all right thank you so much for speaking to us today if anyone missed part of the talk or would just like to watch it again because it was so interesting, I will try to have it posted to our YouTube page by the end of the week. All right, thank you very much. Have everyone have a, a great day. And remember that we have Friends of the Frankfurt Library annual meeting events all throughout the week, and our exhibit will be up until the end of the month.
congratulations and thank you for doing what you're doing for baseball, uh, especially for Lou Gehrig. Thank you, Alan. It's been fun. I appreciate it.